Welcome to Real Talk with Glenn and Mike, the show that gives you real, raw, and unfiltered conversations with your favorite African thought leaders and trendsetters. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Real Talk with Glenn and Mike. I'm your host, uh, Mike, and you can see the other one, Glenn, is over there. Joining us today on our other show is Ruazano Makumbe, young, brilliant Zimbabwean <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when I say trailblazer, she's a trailblazer. You're going to get to know her more uh, throughout the conversation. Glenn, what's goody? Why are you being dramatic? How am I being dramatic? <laughs> Probably <laughs> being dramatic. Oh, a few seconds ago, that wasn't your energy, but anyway. Um, as a oh, you can put me on blast in front of the whole world. I don't mind, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Okay. But it's, it's, it's my pleasure to have Ruadza on. You know, you know what? I was laughing when you did the introduction. So um, mm-hmm. for the people back at home, we, mm-hmm. we record a couple of sessions a day. So I did the intro on the previous show. And I say real talk with Mike and Glenn. Now, Mike does the intro. He says real talk with mm-hmm. Glenn and Mike. <laughs> so I was just laughing about that dynamic. But anyway, Ruadza, welcome. Thank you, guys. I'm so excited to be joining you today and to talk about everything and anything with you. All the secrets are coming out today, Ma. Certainly. Everything and everything. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Glenn, you can kick it off, man. Um, actually, let me kick it off. This is always fun. Um, Rods, I know I, they, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have read up on your accomplishments, but there's still some people that are probably following the broadcast who are wondering, Rods, I know, who is this girl? Could you just give them a little briefing to say who is Wazano Makumbe and what makes her tick? Okay, uh, my name is Rua. Um, yeah, everyone calls me Rua pretty much. And uh, by training, I'm a lawyer. Uh, but in terms of my work, I focus on international justice and human rights. And currently, I'm based in the UK, where I am a Hillary Rodan Clinton Scholar at Swansea University. And I also work as an international justice and human rights consultant for the Asia, Asia Justice Coalition Secretariat. So that's basically the professional side of me, but as an individual and on a personal level, I am more of an introvert and um, enjoy my own space. Yeah, I am an introvert and I enjoy my own personal space. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not too loud, but at the same time, I am loud. <laughs> Uh, you will get what I mean, but yeah. And also, I enjoy being in the outdoors, so I spend most of my time outdoors, especially during the lockdown. I've had the advantage of enjoying whales, traveling around, and making new friends. So they have a lockdown, and instead of staying in, like the lockdown says, you decided my... No, no, you should, no, no my, you, should, you should visit whales. You understand what I mean. We have our own set of rules of course there's a lockdown but we have had our own set of rules over the period we are not like england we are whales <laughs> I, I feel that that was and is actually just low-key jiving me right now <laughs> 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 because i'm going in england and that was a direct attack but i mean let's um take us through the journey on how you ended up being a lawyer uh, today, today, I mean, because obviously you and I know each other, I'm going to try and take a back seat and allow you and Mike to gang up on me. I'll be the mature one, yeah. But, Ruazano, take us on how you became a lawyer, that journey. And... Oh, uh, well, let's just say it started when I was in high school. So I went to St. David's Girls I Bonda. Uh, in the last week, we have seen people on Twitter saying, that's not true. I don't agree with that. But anyway, I went to I saw the pain in that statement. <laughs> I went to Bonda Form 1 to Form 6. And during that time, for my O levels, I did arts and commercials. And I was more of a inclined to the commercial side. So I saw myself as an accountant during my O levels. And uh, when it came to A level, I was forced to do arts. So I ended up doing history, divinity, and literature. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I had fantastic teachers as well. And they pushed me to the extent that I, I literally enjoyed school. That was the first time I ever enjoyed school. So yeah, the outcome was illustrative of that. I got 15 points. And during that time as well, you remember Kudara, we had newspapers where they would profile someone. So in one of the newspapers, they profiled 
Mumbi Jakanana, who was, I think, 3BZ legal counsel or something like that. And I, I took that section of the newspaper and I put it in my diary because it was so inspirational to me. I was like, hmm, I can actually be a lawyer. I can actually be doing what she's doing. And yeah, four years later, I graduated from UZ Law School and there I was. But I, I was lucky also to realize the path that I wanted to follow at an early stage in my law, in my law school uh, career. Because in first year, that's when I was like, hmm, I enjoy human rights issues. I enjoy women's rights issues. I enjoy social issues. I enjoy social justice, like just understanding people's behaviors and understanding how our society constructs those behaviors. And that's the path I followed. I, I was privileged to have worked with um, the project and the Ford Foundation, the Young Women's Leadership, because that's where the mentorship started with Dr. Wakwita. That's where the direction started in terms of pointing out what you can do, how you can contribute, how you can work with people, how you can build networks and how you can build relationships. And from that, we had Say What with, um, with a lot of brilliant people. We have Glenn Say What here. Uh, Say What was amazing. It was great mentorship. We learned so much. And over the years, so much has come from that. But that was the basis of me deciding to take this part as an international law and human rights lawyer. Mike, that, never uh, give a lawyer a microphone, bro. Hey? Eh? Never give a lawyer a microphone to the Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> the Hawkins. She did not even breathe. She literally just breathed the last one. Like, that was... <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mike, you wanted to say? <laughs> I'm curious. Um, law in Zimbabwe must be very challenging. Law in Africa in general must be very challenging. Um, is this something you're passionate for, or is it a, like is this like I always say to people, I was called to be a broadcaster because of what I love doing. Um, is this a job for you, or is this a, a, a something you do out of love, out of passion? Because it's challenging. It is challenging and I'm lucky because I do it because I love it, but I actually enjoy it. I enjoy it. So it's a passion, but also it's purpose driven in the sense that I have realized that what I can do to contribute is through this, through the basis of, of the law degree. But for me, the law degree was just, you know, a stepping stone into something more broader and wider. And I think I've used it to that extent because my work is not only limited to, you know, the, the technicalities of the law. I actually, yes, like I do that, but I go beyond that because that's where I find more purpose because you're linking more with people's lives and you're linking more with how you can assist. I had a conversation with someone this past week and we were asking each other, how can we contribute to Zimbabwe from our little corners, I believe, and contributing from your little corners, like the little that you can do, do that. Mm -hmm. And what I do, I feel it does contribute. It may not be as visible, but I feel that everything does contribute and it's more about purpose and finding ways to make yourself useful whilst you're here on earth. So uh, you, you keep on using the word contribute and I've run out of the number of times you've used it. <clears throat> what exactly do you mean by that? And what are you contributing to? What's, what's the end game for you? Well, contributing in the sense that you are making someone's life better. You are making, if it's just one person, that's okay. If it's contributing to a process, that's fine. If you're contributing like a drop in the ocean, that's, that's fine. You're, bringing some positive change and you're bringing some sort of smile to someone's life. It may not be the immediate or the direct result that you see, but eventually the end of the equation, there's someone who's there who's like, well, this has changed for me. So in terms of my work, I work in international justice and international human rights. So you can imagine I work looking at uh, violations, gross human rights violations. I recently was working on a project on Yemen and we all know what is happening in Yemen. And in, 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 in that project, my role was to understand how we can use technology in, in finding accountability for those people, in finding accountability and justice for victims. It may not be that I'm not based in Yemen and I've never been to Yemen, but the end game that we want to see is for people held accountable. And we are seeing this in the UK where we have decisions that prohibit, for example, the UK government from selling arms to the Saudi-led coalition, which is contributing to the, to the conflict in Yemen. 
So that is something because you you are part of the equation, you are part of the solution, you're part of the people who are pushing for something to take a different direction, looking at where we are right now. Now, here comes the challenging part um, with people in your field. At times, you meet, you, you, you meet a lot of resistance. And I'm not just talking from a governmental standpoint, but just from people. Um, mm-hmm. People might not necessarily conform to what the outcome is of your suggestions. And so how do you go about ensuring that your contribution is of value? That's very valid and that's very important. And I think it has shaped the way in which I do my work and the way in which I approach people that that I work with. I've been privileged in the sense that I started in in Zimbabwe. I started in the global south. I started working with ordinary people who who had everyday problems. So that means that I have an understanding of what goes on on the ground and I have an understanding of what goes on in where people don't have so many resources or be where people cannot access certain resources. And I think that's a privilege because it's, you know, those humble beginnings really shape you and they shape your understanding of how you can help the next person. So we have had this discussion of saying people who work in international justice or people who work in human rights or developmental aid come from a position of privilege of feeling that they have this supremacy thing going on where they feel like they're saviors. You know, we've been talking about white saviors in the past few months because of the Black Lives Movement. But I feel I have been privileged because I have come from that place. That's that's the society that shaped me. That's the village that raised me. Those are my family, that's my family, my friends, my colleagues. So I use that knowledge and that connection that we have to make sure that everything that I do, like currently with AJC, I work in communications, advocacy and campaigns, and I design all that with the understanding of what really works for people. And it's shaped on people's lived realities, not that superficial thinking of saying, oh, we can save this, we can change this, because it's not that simple. It's people's lives that you're dealing with on an everyday basis. Does, does it not get <clears throat> to a point where it's depressing, dealing with all of us, yeah. you know, um, vicarious trauma, where you see what somebody else is going through? And sometimes you feel like my work just goes as far as t- taking my mind, applying it, you know, to the situation, and um, presenting a paper or outcome is a document. But maybe you haven't seen the exact outcome of what your, your work has done in changing this person's life. Now, how, how does that feel like on a day-to-day basis, having to be exposed to so much that is wrong in the world and you having an expectation of yourself and some people employing you and saying, we are also giving you that obligation to be part of the solution. How, how does that feel? I'm glad that you talk about vicarious trauma. It's real and it's a reality. And it was until last year that I actually got to sit down with myself and realize that it's something you need to deal with because it's a reality. So I, I had the opportunity to work in Zimbabwe, you know, that in civil society. And the clients that we worked with are victims of uh, torture, victims of violence, people who have gone through traumatic, real life traumatic experiences, which if they recover from, you will say, oh, wow. And not only does that, you know, that's a Okay, Mike, can you hear me? Oh, what's going on? Happening, And you have to take the time to sort of, you know, think about it, take a step back and get the assistance that you need. Last year, I had to see a therapy, the therapist, because I needed someone to talk to about it. I needed to to sort of offload because I was having nightmares after months of working on difficult cases and difficult situations. So it's one of those things that you have to find a balance and have to find a way to focus on your well-being as well as an individual, but also realize that your work is just as important and it shapes you. It's who you are, but at the same time, you who are on a personal level, you're also very important and you need to focus on yourself on your well-being, on your mental health. So I'm just going to ask for a few seconds to plug my computer on. It's telling me I'm left with a few seconds on it. Okay. But Mike, Mike can talk. Okay, sure. Um, which goes now back to the question that I initially had 
about the challenges that you face um, from a resistance standpoint, right? Okay. If we're going to use, for example, Zimbabwe as an example, um, human rights violations have been going on for the longest of times. And so getting into such a field, I can only imagine the cases that you have to encounter and how many and the volume of those cases and the extreme circumstances. Um, when you're dealing with such a field, would you advise someone to venture in it based on monetary gain? Because lawyers do get paid mm -hmm. <laughs> versus the passion because it's the money worth it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer this on, a, on two levels. The first is obviously on a legal level. And the second, I'm going to speak as a young woman. First, on a legal level, I would not advise anyone to get in, into human rights or human rights and law related work based on the motivation of just money. Why? Because this is beyond money. It's something that goes beyond you. Because at the end of the day, remember, we are trying to assist people. So most of the work that you will do is pro bono basis. You're doing it for free to help people. Of course, if you get funding, if you get assistance in terms of um, financial or technical, that's a plus. But in some of those cases, most of the work that you're doing is not because you're getting money. It's because you genuinely want to help people. And there should be that motivation. There should be that feeling of, you know, this is my purpose and this is where I'm, I'm supposed to be. And then I'm going to answer now on a, on, a, on a basis that I'm a young woman. I think if, when we look at such a question, we always go like, oh, do, money, yes, it's important, but don't base on it. But as a young woman, I feel like our society does not really talk about money enough. Our society does not nurture and groom our relationship with money as we are growing up. And I think this is a disservice to all of us because our relationship with money is not a good one for starters. It becomes, you know, money becomes this creature and it becomes something that you don't want to associate yourself with. That's why when we see if someone is being um, insulted, people who go to the money issues, particularly if it's a woman, you're a gold digger, you or she does that, she does it for money, she does that. That's, that's, that, that's what we see most of the time. But to be honest, as young people, and as young women particularly, money is very important because it also contributes to your self-esteem, it contributes to your personal development, it contributes to you being able to invest in yourself, it contributes to giving you that independence and being able to stand on your own two feet. So I, 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 I think for me it was only last year that it kicked in my mind, I was like, hmm, money is very important, I really need to think about this seriously. And that's when I was like, I need to educate myself, invest time in financial literacy and actually realizing that when you go for a job interview, you should be able to say that this is how much I want to be paid, stand on it and be able to, you know, indicate that this is what I bring to the table. So this is what I serve in, 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 in return. And I feel there should be more education on that, particularly in our African society. I think that is very important. But back to your question, on those two bases and in both responses, I would say you don't need to have uh, monetary motivation for you to get into human rights and law work because it's it's beyond that. It goes beyond money. It goes it's your everyday life. You understand? Like you you go home after a day's work, you can't just switch off your phone and say, "Well, I'm done," because you're going to be called in the middle of the night. You have to go there. And if it was just for money, sometimes it will feel as though you're not getting enough. And I feel like most of us are not paid what we deserve in terms of the work that we do. We see most of our great, great lawyers, most of our great human rights activists, people who do advocacy in Zimbabwe, I don't think they're paid as much as they deserve globally, actually. So yeah, there's, there's, there's that you, that you need to appreciate that at the end of the day, it's all about you. It's all about understanding that this is my purpose. This is what I want to do with my life. And you're investing in yourself, but also you're investing in your personal satisfaction as, you know, someone who is here to do something to around the world. Rua, I'm going to backtrack a bit and say, <clears throat> let's go back to the time you finished university or mm -hmm. maybe from the time you knew that human rights is what you wanted to do. How... What was the connection from the intention to actually becoming a human rights lawyer? Because I feel like one of the, one of the things that all law students 
um, pe people from the legal profession are just starting out struggle with is that decision on should I go to criminal law, should I go to corporate law, should I should I do human rights, and even if I want to, how do I get into that? You know, uh, and especially when you're coming back from um, where we grew up in in Zimbabwe in Africa, sometimes you have to know certain people in order for you to get the kind of job that is that you want to do or that is suited for you. So for you, how was the journey like? You make a valid point when you say it's quite difficult for a lot of people understanding what they want to do and how they can actually get to do it. In my case, I was privileged because when I joined the Investor of Zimbabwe in 2011, I then became, I joined the Young Women's Leadership Project, which was funded by Ford Foundation. And uh, that was in August. And by October, I had been invited by the facilitator to be the student coordinator. So this put me on the spotlight in terms of my responsibilities on that project. But it also meant that it gave me an opportunity to start exploring different things. So from that moment onwards, I got the exposure for the next four years. I got the exposure. It was the first time that I attended conferences and presented in conferences. It was the first time I had to be able to speak to university uh, secretary, university authorities. It was the first time that I could, you know, meet people who were doing uh, different work around the world. And that was a privilege. I consider it a privilege. And I got mentorship from Dr. Wakuti. I'll keep emphasizing on the mentorship part because Dr. Wakuti was one of those people who did not look at me as a first year law student, but she looked at me through the eye that you can do anything and you can actually build the project. So she allowed me to build the project together with others and design the project and implement it. So that gave me so much exposure and everything else that came after, then, you know, just followed the sequence. So in terms of now me deciding to do human rights work, because at the time, the first thing that I was doing was sexual and reproductive health and rights work. That was the focus, sexual and reproductive health rights, focusing on young women and girls. And um, that was interesting. And then as time went on, I became, I started working with Say What, and Say What also was sexual and reproductive health rights. But you know, this kind of thing sort of exposes you. Of course, you're working in SRHR, but it exposes you to other things. And I had the privilege of doing law. So at, on the side, I'm doing my law courses that are also telling me about things that are going on in the legal field. And I tried to merge this too. I remember the first thing that I did was to draft a sexual harassment policy for the University of Zimbabwe. And that was because the Ford Foundation project. Prior, prior to you doing that, the University of Zimbabwe did not have a sexual harassment policy. Yes, they did not have a sexual harassment policy. So that was me merging the two of the project that I was working with uh, under Ford Foundation and my studies as a law student. So it fit in perfectly well. And I think it was then that I realized that hmm, I could make a career out of this. And I chose to follow that. So after graduation, I started working with Say What. I actually went to Say What, I remember, after my exams in June. And I told them, I told, um, I told the guys, I was like, I need a job. Of course, I had been working with them, but as a student and on a not a full-time basis. So I went to them and I told them I need a job. And my mom also had called me and said, oh, you should go to Say What. Tell them you want a job. You need to start working there because you're done now. So I just went there and I said I want a job. And the next Monday they said, come. So I started. But you, you, you can see that there was that relationship. And it was from there that I decided probably I needed to build more of the legal side because Say What also was trying to, you know, build me as a lawyer and also build me as an SRHR person. So I had that, those two connections, which was great and which was brilliant. But after that, I decided to join the judiciary. So I worked for the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court from December 2015. And that was a privilege in itself because I was moving from civil society, coming to the government, but also entering a new field that, of course, is mostly law, but this is the government. So you, you start to get an understanding of how governments work, how bureaucracy works, how procedure works. And you, I was working with judges in the superior courts. So obviously my mind was working over time. Like you, you just need to be on top of your game. So you are built and you're molded to be someone who is thorough. You are molded to be someone who understands the importance of every word in a, in a legal pleading. You, you, you have to, to have that sense of thoroughness. So over time that was developed and I then had the privilege of 
joining the Erasmus Mundus program with the European Commission. And yeah, that's how I, I sort of built on the Erasmus Mundus program. Sorry? What is the Erasmus Mundus program? So the Erasmus Mundus program is a uh, an international program that is funded by the European Commission. The idea is to bring students from around the world to partake or participate in different fields, in different programs. My program particularly was uh, human rights policy and practice. And this is an amazing program which focuses on human rights of obviously, but also brings different um, disciplines. So it's more of an interdisciplinary starter with law, with politics, with ethics, you know, with anthropology, you get to merge that into one thing, but also with the aim of understanding the practice of it. So for me, that worked well because I'm a very practical person. I think in a very practical way. And the policy part of understanding how laws, how pieces of legislation come into being, and also how societies design their policies. So that was brilliant. And the program allows you to study for two years in okay. Europe. Um, for me, it was three countries. For some programs, it's two countries. For some programs, it's four countries. But it becomes a joint uh, master's program in three universities. So I was in Spain, Sweden, and the UK. And uh, over the two years, you're traveling around uh, these countries. You're going around these universities. And at the end, you get a joint master's degree, which is quite cool because you have sort of, you know, had the best of all worlds. So you look at the UK, they're like, what's the best that the UK can offer? They take that from the UK. You look at Sweden, what's the best that Sweden can offer? You take that from the, you look at Spain, what's the best that Spain can offer? You take that. So I, I would highly recommend for other Zimbabweans to apply for it. I've been, I've been very happy because this year we had one Zimbabwean who was successful in their application and I was so, so happy and she'll be joining the program. She's a brilliant lawyer. I'm so excited and proud of her. But yeah, that's the Erasmus Mundus program. And after that program, I also had had the opportunity to work in London with the law firm to you know to con to contribute to what they were doing. They were mostly doing climate change, so there was that thing of merging a lot of different fields, a lot of different areas, but all feeding into international law or international human rights. And at the end, I decided to go back home. So I went back home to work in civil society. At first, I went back to the government. I worked in the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court and um, that was for a while and then I moved on to civil society where I joined the Zimbabwe Human Rights and Dual Forum as a strategic impact litigation specialist and that was a role that I loved. I absolutely enjoyed it. It had its challenges in terms of the work itself but and the environment as well but at the end of the day it was something that I cherished. The experience was beyond me. I got also to work with brilliant, brilliant minds in Zimbabwe, both lawyers and non-lawyers. Now, I'm listening to your journey, and it sounds like you've taken advantage of every opportunity thrown yeah. at you. Um, I, I'm very curious, though, how many women have the same advantages in your field? I say this because you've emphasized on the women, the women, the women, the women part. And so that triggered that thing of exactly how many women are able to accomplish the same thing. The field is not very wide in terms of allowing women to to be part of you know the system there isn't that wideness that you would hope and it's it's obviously still very male dominated particularly when i look at wanting to move from working at the national level and building your career at an international level that has always been my motivation and what i want and i'm still working on that i'm still working towards that every day to build a career uh, on the international platform. So now, because I've had these opportunities, I've been exposed to some of those opportunities, I realized that there are very few women actually, and there are many reasons why there are very few women. And also having the opportunity to speak to, you know, people who have made it, for example, my mentor, Hillary Clinton, who ended up realizing that it's... My mentor, Hillary Clinton, she just dropped it, like this, oops, by the way, my mentor, Hillary <laughs> Clinton... <laughs> you can continue. Yeah, so it, you realize that there are many reasons why there aren't so many women. It's 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 a it's a whole number of reasons, but obviously we know that um, 
from history, women's, women's participation in careers that like law, careers like engineering, careers like medicine was limited in itself. But also now when we look at our system, there are so many things that stop women from, from you know, rising from the top. I remember I was talking to um, one woman who's very inspirational. She's now a judge in, in, in the UK here. And she was indicating that when she went to law school, they were obviously around 30 to 40% of women in her law school. But now when she looks at herself, like 30, 40 years later, it's only two women from, from her stream that have made it to be on top of their fields or to be, you know, in the executive in their fields. And we obviously question a lot of things. And she said one of the things is that when women finish law school, or when they get a training contract in the case of the UK and they start uh, doing, the, doing the training contract, they also move over to, you know, building a family to start a family and they get married and all that. And in that process, some drop out because they focus on children, on getting children, on building their families, and many never make it back into the career field. And those who make it back are not given the attention that they actually deserve because there's, there isn't much of that understanding of a career gap. It's only now that we're seeing, you know, movements saying, no, we need to change this. We need to have women involved. We need to have women at all stages, but also understanding that that career gap comes with a lot of transferable skills that no one will get even if they're in any, in any job or in any form of employment. So it, it's quite a narrow field, but I'm so glad and I'm so lucky that in my way, in my part so far, I've met some women who have inspired me, who have motivated me to know that it's actually possible. And think worse when I see a Zimbabwean woman who is making it, who is doing a lot of work and who is, you know, making a difference in the international platform. For me that day, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. I'm like, oh yes. And I'm, I'm excited because next week I'm going to be having, um, I'm, I'm going to be moderating a session with one of those women. And I'm looking forward to it because she has really shown me that it's actually possible that I'm not crazy. I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not, you know, in my own mind thinking that this is actually possible, but she has done it in the show that with so much hard work and with so much dedication and understanding the support that you can get from other people, because there are people who are willing to help, you can make it. Mm. How old are you? Sorry? How old are you? I'm 28 years old. So knowing all this that you've been talking about, how has that kind of exposure and understanding shaped your the way you approach your social life and your career. How do you strike that work-life balance? And how do you how do you how do you tinker around there to say, okay, fine, I know that if I go away, if I get married, if I have a child, I'm gonna have a career gap, but this is what is gonna happen. How has that changed your understanding of those two worlds? I think that's a very difficult question, but um, I can say that I have really thought about it and I'm 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 quite lucky in the sense that I get to think about it and I get to make decisions and I get to make choices because a lot of people don't have that privilege. But I have that opportunity to think that, okay, if I do this, this can work. But at the same time, I, I think it's about your partner. It's about the person that you're with and to what extent you guys can understand each other in terms of building what you want together and also understanding the individuality of each other. And at the same time, I wanted to to just highlight that in terms of the exposure and in terms of looking at what other people have done and looking at how other people have done, I, th I, I have come to just understand that it's, it's possible and it's all about convenience and it's all about time. So when you have the opportunity to do what you have dreamed of, what you have dreamt of doing in your life, then I think you should go for it. And also for me personally, I don't believe in what people have said for decades that you cannot have it all. I believe you can have it all. I believe it's very possible. How is up to you. How you're going to make it happen is up to you. But I believe it's possible. And it's also about um, decisions that you make on an everyday basis and what you choose and the people that you choose to invest in around you. Mm -hmm. Which uh, brings another question. I, I, I'm curious to hear more about your experience. 
as a young female working under the Supreme Justice, working in all these fields, in terms of respect, do they give you the same amount of respect? So I worked in the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court as a um, legal researcher. To How old were you then? Sorry? How old were you then? That's 2015. I was 20, 23, I think. 23, yeah. Okay. I was 23 at the time when I started. And, you know, when you, you, it's, it's a position that was just starting, but also the idea was to take young brilliant lawyers and put them in that space and develop them and see them grow and see them develop under the mentorship of judges so you know superior court judges for me they are brilliant in terms of the way they think in terms of the way they analyze in terms of you know in terms of having that that holistic approach to different to different fields and to different areas because of course there's the law but the law is applied to various fields so it might be corporate it might be an engineering thing it might be a medical thing it's you need to have that mind that is quite brilliant and that is quite versatile and they have that so in terms of us as young people you go into that space knowing that you want to grow you go into that space understanding that this is the best place to be and to be honest it was well during my time it was one of the best jobs that you could get coming out of law school because a lot of people go to law firms but you get to work with the judges and that was a plus and also the salary at the time was like three times more than what you would get um, at a law firm so it was really a good position when we started we got training and uh, in terms of that training it was just to highlight you know how you work with judges the questions of respect how you present yourself to judges how you you relate with your colleagues how you do your work how you should present your work and also how you manage your time because it's a lot of work and in terms of respect for me i faced i think we faced challenges with my colleagues when we started because we had um we had people that we reported to. There was a senior researcher whom we reported to, and then we had judges whom we reported to, and then we also had the Judicial Services um, Commission that we reported to. So this was like different levels. And then also on the side, there is the registry, where the registrar is the head, and you report to her as well. So you can imagine that we had different streams of work coming in, and this meant that more work this meant that you cannot say no to anyone, but obviously you are told that you prioritize this kind of work, you prioritize this sort of work, and you had to get your head around it, but also understanding how do you make sure that your work is balanced. And that was a challenge for me because I was working all the time. When I say all the time, I mean Saturday and Sunday, including- We're not working all the time? We were working all the time we would finish work even after 12 midnight we were working all the time you start early you finish late saturday and sunday you are working and that what that really has a negative effect i don't believe in overworking i think that that is just not right for you for you and your, your well-being and even your work like the the product of your work i don't think it benefits from that and i I, I'm grateful that I had friends who kept trying to pull me out, you know, to remind me that uh -uh, you cannot be doing this all the time. I'm grateful for that. I think that's what kept me sane. And that's I also had amazing colleagues that I was working with. So that kept us sane. And also, because you're starting, you may not be in a position to speak out and say, well, there is a this is just too much, but ever because you feel like you are benefiting more. But I think as you get older, that's when you realize that no, you're contributing something. So you you should have a voice, and you should be able to to say this works and this doesn't, and you should be able to devise a plan to make sure that you still are able to do the same amount of work, but it's done in a way that is sensitive to you as your per as a person, and it's done in a way that is sensitive to your mental health and to your wellness. Hmm. That's a re a really intriguing. Um, as you walk this path and you meet all these powerful women, um, what kind of advice do they give you? Um, because I, I, I myself have spoken to powerful women and sometimes they'll tell me, you know, before I got to the stage and point where everybody jumps and they respect me, I had to go through some challenges. And I had to make people understand that my challenges as a woman and, and the challenges of my male counterparts are completely different. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice do they give you? One of the 
Well, I have two pieces of advice. Well, let's just say what kind of ad- advice did Hillary Clinton give you? Hillary Clinton has advice for me that really resonated and that really made sense to me the first the time I met her was that. Oh, so you, you met her more than once? You need to. No, I met her. I met her. Well, I had a couple of days with her here in Swansea. She okay. came out. Fun. Tell so, me more. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> It was it was truly a privilege and it was truly an honor to you know to realize that she's actually invested in developing us young women. She is invested in seeing our progress, like genuinely invested on a personal level. She has done so much in terms of keeping up with us and checking up on us, even during this pandemic. She has made sure that we have everything that we need and we are taking care of ourselves. So I'm, I'm quite grateful for that. But um, going back to the question of um, pieces of advice, we had, um, I had a meeting with, with um, a very inspirational woman, but very witty as well. And she said to me- Names, please feel free. You can <laughs> well, I, I won't say names, but yeah. She uh, said to me, uh, always go for the most challenging thing. So if you get two opportunities, always take the challenging route because you don't want to become boring. Like she literally used the word boring. She said you don't want to become boring because if you go for the easier thing, you're easily going to get bored and you are going to become boring. So if you go for the challenging thing, like it will keep you on your toes. You'll forever be thinking about how can... I work around this. How can I make this better? How can I make this the best that it can be? So I was like, hmm, this makes sense. And I've applied it and well, yeah, we're yet to see, but well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. And then the other piece of advice that I received was recently was always have an, an opinion. So as a young woman, always have an opinion. It's not to say that I've not had that. I I am the first born in a family of three girls and I will say that my father and my mother have raised us to always have an opinion. They have raised us to always use our minds, to always think for ourselves and to always look up for ourselves. So that is something that I've had all my life. But when it was said last week, it was always have an opinion. As a young woman, always have an opinion and have the courage to speak your mind, have the courage to say it out. And I thought that goes a long way. Why? Because... You see that in many cases as young women, we, we sort of shy away. We, we, we shy away of, from saying things. So you think a lot, like you're thinking, what is, what is this person going to think? What if I don't make sense? What if they don't understand what I'm saying? And that pro- I'm probably guilty of overthinking, but I've realized that if, if it makes sense to you, then just say it because it's something that you truly believe in and it's something that you're motivated and passionate about. And I think that's all that matters. How someone responds to your thoughts and how someone responds to what you believe in, that's a different story altogether. So those two pieces of advice have really got me moving. If you, if you believe in something, say it. Always have an, opi- have an opinion. And this also means that it's not just about speaking, but use the space that you have. Use the talents that you have to express yourself. I, I love to write, not writing fictional stuff or writing stories. I'm not so good at that. But I love to write. I love to look at what our society is going through and putting my thoughts on paper, either as an article or as a post. I enjoy doing that. And then day, it really gets me satisfied. And I've realized that, yeah, do that. Don't don't overthink things. Put put. You know, an interesting thing about what you're saying. A couple of years back, I was on this um, regional conference. It was called, I think, Participate by um, Yet. Yeah, they invited Jessima Jome, who was an honourable member of parliament then, and so they were on a panel, and and she was asked one of the most important pieces of advice she would give to young people. And she said, leaders are always opinionated. And that the moment I had that, I ran with that all my life. And this is the funny coincidence that you find that. So Jesse Majome is a lawyer. Um, and also the, the kind of um, advice that is coming from another young lawyer, from another lawyer, is about opinions. That, that must be, uh, I think, something very important in that it has been mentioned in such uh, many spaces. But I think before we... Obviously, I know Rwazana is a way of getting into issues in depth, but just a brief, you know, how did you end up being mentored by Hillary Clinton? 
because Mike seems very interested by it. Oh, bro. Because this is not just where you just go to OK and you see her. Like, Every time you say Senator Hillary Clinton. Talk to this, bro. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, I'm sorry. No, please. For, it, it was last year uh, uh, in July, at early July. So I'm part of this network of women international lawyers. It's called the Atlas Network. And uh, on that platform, a lady who is now my mentor posted about um, a program that they were starting. This program was aimed at young leaders, both male and female, young leaders who are working on global challenges. So whatever field that you're working in, but something that is really giving our world a, a hard time and a difficult time in terms of designing solutions and designing initiatives to address that. And I thought it was interesting. When I saw it, I went through it. I was like, hmm, this, is, this is something for me. This is something I would absolutely love. This is something I would enjoy doing. So I started working around that and I contacted that lady and she said, Ruah, we would definitely love to receive your application. We would definitely love to hear from you. You seem to be one of the people that we are looking for. So I submitted my application on my birthday on 22 July last year. Um, I emphasize on my birthday because I believe my birthday is very magical. So I applied on my Everybody's birthday. Everybody's birthday is magical, Ruah. <laughs> 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 No, mine is extra magical. So I submitted my application on that day and um, a month later I had back from them and they said we really enjoyed reading through your application. And also, if I may just stress that during that time um, last year, you remember in Zimbabwe there were, there were ongoing issues in terms of political instability. So it was all coupled with that, like my application reflected how I felt about the situation and where I positioned myself in that situation. So they responded to me probably a month later and they indicated that I would definitely love to speak with you. So they organized an interview, a Skype interview. And in that Skype interview, they, there was Swansea University that is hosting scholars and then there was sky a representative from sky because sky is the is the financial contributor to the program financial and technical support and then also secretary clinton because this was an initiative by secretary clinton herself so we had one a representative from secretary clinton's office and during that interview i absolutely enjoyed it um I would like to talk about interviews, remind me later. Interviews and job opportunities, remind me later. But yeah, I did the interview. I absolutely loved it. I loved talking to them. I loved telling them about my story, but also I loved them telling me about their story, telling me about what they envisaged this program to be, because this was something, that was a first. Like This was an initiative that had a visionary in it. It had Secretary Clinton at the center of it. So I wanted to really understand what their motivations were and how really I can be part of it, but also grow from being a part of it. So yeah, a month later, they called me and they said, yeah, we, we were so excited to hear from you and we loved our conversations. We would love to see you in Swansea. So yeah, I picked my bags, came to Swansea and joined the program. So they wanted five people. But when I came to Swansea, I realized that I, we were two people. So I, I was confused and I was worried that my mom was going to be, uh -uh, this is not a legit thing. You know, how, like I thought she was going to be worried. And I asked them to explain to me why they had two people. And they said, because this is such a bespoke program. We received over 200 applications. We interviewed over 30 candidates, but we only got two people whom we felt belonged to this program. So we were two people when we started and, and it was quite exciting because I made a new friend, I made a new colleague, she's absolutely amazing. And uh, she's brilliant, she is so brilliant. So I had someone to learn from and someone to, you know, to bounce off ideas, we became sisters immediately. And the, the university here, the staff and everyone, has been amazing they supported me you know moving from zimbabwe coming here they supported me and helped me move into this space of being a hillary Rodham clinton scholar because it came with so much that i didn't understand and a few probably a month later we were told that well secretary clinton is actually coming to meet you i was like hmm, okay 
this is exciting. <laughs> and it was, it was exciting to be honest. It was exciting, but at the same time, it was like, I'm dreaming. Like I didn't know what to expect and I didn't know how to prepare for it. So I kept asking them, what is expected of me? What should I do? And I just be yourself. She's coming to The worst advice people give (laughs) is that. (laughs) Like, I can't be myself right now. Like, I That's very true. No, that's very true. Because in my mind, I was like, I can't be myself. Because if I'm going to be myself, knowing myself, I'm going to run and just want to hug her and hold her. And they're like, no, well, just be yourself. Just, Just enjoy the experience. She's coming to meet you. She's coming to hear your story. She's coming to understand what you want to do with your life, how you want to find your purpose and how you want to enhance your work. And it was like, oh, cool. So she came to Swansea and it was absolutely amazing. It was a dream, I would say. How did it feel to be in the same room with her? And I remember at the time I saw social media broke with a picture of you and Hillary Clinton, Senator Clinton. People were like, this amazing Zimbabwean lawyer with Hillary Clinton. How did it feel for you? Because if everybody else had this euphoria about it, and this is a second and third experience for them. But for you, this is first hand, you're leaving it. It was, it was like a dream. It was an experience that for the first week after, because she was here for a week, so we spent the week with her. For the week after, I could not explain it. Like I could not put it in words. I was just like, <gasps> you know, when people ask me, I've just been like, <gasps> I could not experience. I could not explain how I was feeling. It was that deep for me. But what made it such an experience was not because was not just because I was meeting Secretary Clinton, but was the manner in which Secretary Clinton met me. Met Rua, met Rua from Odzi, Rua who went to Bonda. That that's what I think shaped the experience and made the experience very phenomenal for me. She has this level of brilliance that I experienced, and that I was like, if I can be as half as brilliant as she is, I would have done so much with my life. She is brilliant, and she has this warmth that we possibly do not see on the screen she has this personality that you know she exudes this sense of brilliance that we don't experience and that we don't see on the screen and being in the same space with her i was literally sitting right next to her and speaking with her and she, her speaking with me the way she listens to you the way the attention that she gives to you the way she spoke to me she spoke to me as though she had known me all my life she was saying things that i didn't think that she she would even know you know she spoke to me as though she had been with me in zimbabwe she had been with me in 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 my in my younger years and it was i found that very inspiring and i found that very important in leadership and important in being someone who has that power and who has that influence over very important decisions that are made globally. So yeah, the experience was quite was quite amazing for me. But also when I spoke to her, I think the first thing that I say to her was that I'm very proud and happy to be here. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I am just a representation of so many young women from where I come from. I'm just here as a representation. I'm just here to make people realize that African young women are capable of so much and African young women are the future, but also our leaders now. And I think that was very important for me to say because it's very true. I'm here because of a lot of people who believed in me. I'm here because of a lot of people who pushed me and I'm here because of a lot of people who gave me the opportunity and created opportunities for me. So it was one of those things that I will forever treasure. It was one of those experiences that I will forever use, you know, as a sign to other people that whatever you dream of is possible. Whatever you want to make happen is very possible. Yeah. Uh, sorry. You can go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I, I know that we, we're running, um, we're not doing so well with time now. But again, this has been top heavy. I mean, I've just been sitting here learning. Um, I think of all the interviews we've had, this has been one of those where both Mike and I are just chilled. We've been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> We've been schooled. And it's one of those where I've forgotten my glass of whiskey. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and I had to meditate. But let, let me try and bring back also that kind of, you know, the, the personal touch to it, because you have a lot of that. And I've seen glimpses of that even in this interview now. Let's go away from work. What makes you? Oof, I have changed. Like if, 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 if I think of Rua from last year when I came to Swansea and Rua now, so much has changed in my life. So much has changed on a personal level. Um, what makes me is being centered in my person. So be having that connection with the inner Rua, I have become that person who pays attention to the inner Rua who sits down when I feel that my soul and my spirit is just not at peace, I sit down. Like Oprah for now. We want simple things. Like what are the simple things that make you want that? Like Glenn, I wake up, I eat. Glenn, I love my cereal. I mean, I'm just, getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I have to write notes so to speak. It's, it's, it, it all comes from this that Every day I then wake up with that. When I wake up for the past six months, let's say when the pandemic started, I had to restructure the way I do everything. I had to change the way I work, the way I approach work, I approach school and everything. So when I wake up, the first thing I do for the past six months has been to work hard. Now I'll explain why that is important. I have always been someone in my mind who knows that working out is important, but doing it, ooh, it's a different vibe. It's a different vibe. I've always known that this is a very vital part of my life. Like my physical wellness is a very vital part That's of my life. I used to be a running coach. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know that. You know that I've always believed in this. But doing it for me is has uh, was not really a priority because work was a priority. So most of the time I'll be like, oh, I'll do this later. Uh, because I have so much work. But in the past few months, I've realized that, no, I actually perform better when I do this. So this is more important because my performance is dependent on how I'm doing in this, in this field. So every day when I wake up, I go work out. I'm lucky that I have found a group of friends who believe in this too. So we work out together and they push me and they support me. So I've invested so much in my wellness, in my life, in my food intake, what I ate, because also that was something that I knew was important, but because you know, you're, you're busy and your mind is always on the go, you end up just eating anything and everything. And I was doing that and oh, on weight and all that. So I realized I need to, to do better. So I changed the way I eat now. Um, I try as much as possible to eat healthy. I, that is like very important for me. And it has become something that is important of, of course i've realized that we all need to be healthy so let, I me, let me judge you because we're running out of time yeah do you date sorry do you date yes i do but currently i'm single hey oh, bro, bro, bro. Well, to the boys out there <laughs> okay glenn let, let's wrap it up with i like this is glenn's favorite thing i call it the five fingers of death <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, apparently, right. apparently it was that it knows how I developed that. So uh, I used ah, to uh, that spoils it. <laughs> no, no, she does. You, you know, you know, I used to do um a show on Capital FM in Zim. So I oh. used to love to do that whenever I have a guest, I ask them. But I, I got this concept from Oprah, uh the soul super soul conversations, where she asked these five questions at the end. So let's do that with, with words I know now. Five fingers of death. This should be fun. Yes. I, I'm, I'm curious for question number four because that's one. That's the one where everybody goes. Ah. <laughs> nah, she she probably is expecting it. So let's go. One, what's your proudest moment in life? What has been your proudest moment of today? Hmm. Really? I never thought about that. That's the hard one. Supposed to be one of those sessions where you give lengthy answers. It's blitz. I like, ask. Okay. Meeting Hillary Clinton, meeting Secretary Clinton. What are you most embarrassed about? Okay, this is difficult. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Tick tick. Wait, like tick tick. What's, what have you been most embarrassed about in your life? Or what's what what's been the most embarrassing moment of your life so far? This was a game show you'd be losing right now. Yeah, I would be. I know I'm horrible at game shows. I love watching other people, but not me doing it. We'll uh, give you a few more seconds. Tick, 
Can I pass? No, I'll pass. I'll come back to that. What's <laughs> your, is this is a cliche question, but what's your deepest fear? Not living to my fullest potential. Question number four, what is love? <laughs> <laughs> I find it funny how everybody <laughs> poses on that question. <laughs> understanding someone, understanding someone and understanding yourself. So for you, love is understanding someone and understanding yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. What does God mean to you? God. God means compassion, love, kindness, and giving back to the universe. Go back to the last one. Question number two. What's Ooh. the biggest embarrassment of your life or the most embarrassing moment ever? Oh, if you want, I can replace it with another question so that we wrap it up. Please do replace it. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would you change? God, why are you replacing it with an even more difficult question? <laughs> First of all, your body language. It was dependent on your answers, you'd be dead right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one thing I'll change about myself is that I'm too much of an introvert. I'm really, I'm, tr I'm working on that even now. Well, the five fingers of death are done. From me, Glenn, it has been a pleasure having you. I feel like we really, it's partly our fault, but we'd really want to do a second part with you. We'll let yeah. you know when we post this I and when we can hear this. But we're looking forward to a part with you because we've been learning. Mike and I have been schooled. I've never seen Mike and I this quiet. So no quiet, I know, right? I've learned so much from her. The only thing I now know is if there ever is a game where you need to call a friend, don't call Rwanda. Thank you. <laughs> Unless you. But if you ever want to watch a game, you need to... Oh, we can watch it together. I just... Like, if, if they yeah, said... Man, can watch, you know, I watch, I watch Who Wants to Be a Millionaire here. I absolutely love it. And I'm screaming the whole time. But if I was there, I'd be horrible. Mm. So, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, if thank you so much for being here. You are an inspiring young woman. We'll look forward to the rest of your journey. Um, I still think we'll, we'll see how it goes probably in season two or even in season one or the second part to this because there's really a lot of the, I mean, pointers for the future. I think there's a lot that you could do to young people, young women growing up, people probably in primary school, high school, to say, how do you prime yourself to get into that point where you get into law school? Well, I'm afraid I would talk about uh, opportunities and interviews. And That's stuff. where I'm going. Like all of these things are things I think we should yeah. actually do because I feel like this is something that is very useful that parents can even have with their children, sit down and listen. Right. But we are running out of time. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you from me, Glenn Vioio. Ladies and gentlemen, I go by the name of Mike Hovitt. Thank you so much, Rua, for joining us. And that's the show, ladies and gentlemen.